The bad news is that I have to follow Eric Lieni. The good news is that I'm not the last speaker for the day. So uh, thanks very much for inviting me here, Kevin. Um, I'm a freelancer. I've been a freelancer for about 20 years, which is a bit longer than I've been a paid lancer. And the term freelancer comes from the days of the knights. And certain knights in those days would pledge allegiance to anyone who would pay them a fee, a going rate, a retainer. In other words, their lances were free for hire. That's literally where the term comes from. They acted as mercenaries, in a way, um, offering their services to the highest bidder. I can tell you from personal experience these days that freelancers still have to battle to get paid, so nothing much has changed on that score. In any case, going freelance as a journalist means that you're obliged to liberate yourself from certain assumptions. And one of these is the assumption that you can make a living by sticking to the territory you know. So many years ago, when I just started freelancing, I got a call from Kevin Davey, who was editing a monthly magazine about business and financial matters called The Executive. This was around about 1989, 1990. And Kevin said, I hear you've gone freelance. And I said, yeah, that's right. And he said, how would you like to do a story on fund managers for us? How they work, how they think, how they make decisions that affect the lives of millions of people. In effect, how they go about the business of being custodians of the nation's savings. I had no idea at all what Kevin was talking about, not, not the slightest idea. So I said, Kevin, thanks very much. I'd love to do a story on fund managers for the executive. <laughs> I was a freelancer after all. My allowance was for hire. As you can see, even in 1990s, the issues of the day weren't terribly different to what they are today. And uh, before I knew it, I had hopped on a flight to Cape Town, which is, as I discovered, where fund managers hang out. And I was speaking to a young guy in a fancy office in the southern suburbs. He was a fund manager. And I said to him, so how do you work? How do you think? How do you make decisions that affect the lives of millions of people? In effect, how do you go about the business of being a custodian of the nation's savings? And he said, I'll show you. And he sat back in his chair, and he put his feet up on the desk and his hands behind his head, and he looked out at the mountain. And he said, I sit here and I take the long view. Well, that became the intro of my story on fund managers for the executive, and it was a story I really enjoyed doing, even though to this day I'm still not really sure what fund managers do when they're not staring at the mountains. Still, the executive <laughs> paid me handsomely for the story, or at least they paid me for the story, and I went on to write a number of other stories for the magazine in fields as diverse as professional boxing, rock and roll, the armed response industry, and condoms. So for a brief period, technically speaking, I was a financial journalist, working, writing about financial matters for a financial publication. Then again, strictly speaking, I wasn't a financial journalist at all, because in my view, there's no such thing as financial journalism. There is only journalism. A good journalist, I think, will be able to produce good stories by delving into areas that are completely outside their province of assumed interest in or capabilities. My interests and capabilities at that time when I started freelancing were very much popular culture, music, television, society, politics. I never considered myself remotely capable of writing about business at all, and certainly not for a business-specific publication. But as I say, being freelance kind of liberates you from these assumptions. A good editor, too, will test journalists by pushing them into new waters and watching how well they are able to swim. I once worked in a magazine where the editor took great delight in sending the pop critic and the travel writer on investigative forays into the world of rugby, business, and politics. I know because I was the pop critic and travel writer of that magazine, and in retrospect, it was these sorts of stories, initially alien to my narrow scope of enthusiasms, that were the ones I most enjoyed doing. I think the reason most of us become journalists is because we are ubiquitously, unstoppably curious about the world around us. We all know the famous questions that define our profession that are supposed to appear in every intro you write as a news journalist. We ask all the questions, we question all the answers. We are never satisfied with the answers we get. We're always restless, forever jumping from one intriguing and compelling topic to the next. And that's because in journalism there are no single topics. There are no neat and easy issues that do not collide and intersect with other issues in and around their orbit. That's why, by definition, journalists tend to be generalists by nature. 
We are hyper-interested, promiscuously interested in anything and everything. We have short attention spans and even shorter deadlines. And at the same time as we are generous by nature, we are also required to be specialists, particular and specific in our understanding of the world, right up to the point where we can almost call ourselves experts on whatever subject happens to be commanding our attention at any given moment. It definitely happens with me a lot, and I think it pretty much happens with everyone who gets involved in a story that you start from a position of complete ignorance, and as you do your research, and of course these days your research starts on the internet, and then you start talking to people who themselves are experts, and by process of osmosis, you kind of absorb expertise around you. And of course we live in an age of instant expertise where it's pretty easy for anyone to declare themselves an expert after a bit of Googling and Wikipedia hunting and so on and so forth. But our profession requires us to kind of project an illusion of expertise because we can't be experts in every subject that we write about, but we can certainly come across as experts through the way we write, through our understanding of the subject, and of course through, through, the, through the research we do. Um, so we are generalists who specialize, and we are specialists who generalize, and we're not alone in this paradoxical persuasion. A little while ago, I had an assignment that took me into some of the deepest rural areas of South Africa, where I interviewed doctors who worked in the public health sector. So for a short while I was a health journalist too. And I found that a popular and much demand area of clinical practice at the moment is something called family medicine. It's an area that involves working with children, adults, families, and communities in a wide range of disciplines from everyday illness to epidemics to obstetrics to trauma. It's a medical speciality, only recently recognized as such in this country that is born from general practice and that offers great and rewarding opportunities to doctors who want to broaden their horizons. I thought to myself as I listened to these all-rounders talking about what they do, that their work is in many ways similar to journalism, except maybe for the part about obstetrics. But the thing we really have in common, journalists and family medicine practitioners, is that at heart our practice revolves around people. I'm reading a great book at the moment. It's called Hackers and Painters, and it's by a guy named Paul Graham. Who is, he's, he's someone who is equally, equally as good at hacking, not the news of the world variety, but the computer programming variety, as he is at painting pictures. So he's written this book from the viewpoint of someone who is kind of well-versed in two superficially very different disciplines, computer programming, software hacking, as it's known among hackers, and art, classical painting. He explores the creative process of painting and explores the creative process of programming, which doesn't sound like a creative process at all, but he looks at what's common about them. And in this book, he makes a very pertinent point about the nature of art and artists. He says that nearly all the greatest paintings are paintings of people, because people are what people are interested in. And I thought about it, and it's actually quite hard to kind of think to yourself, what are the great paintings that have been produced in the history of painting? The ones that come to mind are pretty much paintings of people. And I think this applies not just to art, but to pretty much any area of artistic endeavor. You know, there are very few works of literature about landscape, very few great movies about spreadsheets, <laughs> very few great plays about the weather. And going beyond the arts, there are very few bridges and buildings and technological inventions that have not in some way been designed to meet and serve the needs of a human audience. It sounds like a truism, and that's because it's true. And the same, of course, applies to journalism. Journalism is not about issues and abstracts. It's about the people who make those issues and abstracts come alive. Journalism is not about data and numbers. It is about the way people bring meaning to data and numbers, and the way data and numbers bring meaning to people. But I think it goes even further than that. I think journalism, at its heart, is a customer service profession. We serve news and information and opinion and analysis and entertainment to our customers. And we serve it in a way that is designed with their needs, with the needs and desires of our customers very much uppermost in mind. The big problem for us is that we very often don't know who our customers are. Our industry is changing so fast, the means of delivery and distribution are changing so fast, that we can no longer assign our readers and our listeners and our viewers into neat little packages of demographics. This applies particularly online where it's very hard to kind of get a grasp on who happens to be reading what you're writing at any given point 
uh, you may be able to tell this uh, in print or you may be able to tell this on radio or, uh, or television where you can get a fairly clear idea of who's reading you but once you're online you're in a space where there are no boundaries at all and it's very hard to say the following are our readers. That's because information today lives as much in the virtual space of the online world as it does in the physical textures of the real world and so our customers across multiple boundaries of age and LSMs and geographical territories. At the same time, if you really want to know who your customers are, if you really want to come face to face with them, there's a very easy way. All you have to do is make a mistake. People who consume works of journalism love nothing more than pointing out the errors of fact and the flaws of analysis that journalists very occasionally make. <laughs> I once wrote a light piece for a magazine entitled The Seven Wonders of South Africa, and one of these wonders is, is a piece of land that lies at the southernmost point of the African continent. And that is, of course, Cape Point. <coughs> Except, of course, it's not. And people who live in Cape Agulhas, or who have been to Cape Agulhas, or who have just read about Cape Agulhas on bubblegum wrappers, get very <laughs> upset and annoyed and write letters to the ed editor when you innocently confuse one southerly point with another southerly point. <laughs> so, Despite Google, despite our instant access to accurate information, it's still po possible and it's probable as well for journalists to make mistakes that are minor and mistakes that are huge. And in fact, this is one of the great benefits of the internet age is that a mistake made online can be kind of fixed almost instantaneously, whereas a mistake made in print will haunt you for the rest of your career. <laughs> Uh, so I'm known as the guy who confused Cape Point with Cape Agulhas, and I've never been allowed to forget it. But my point is, our customers often know more than we may think they know. And what they don't know, they can very easily Google without any assistance from us. So what we need to do as journalists is add value in other ways. By sifting signal from noise, by distilling meaning from chaos, by going out of our way to help people comprehend and make sense of the fast-changing world around them. I just want to give you a quick example of what going out of our way means in the context of contemporary journalism. In the old days of journalism, very few of you probably remember the old days of journalism, before the internet changed our lives so dramatically, journalists would typically work according to strictly defined beats, or desks as they were sometimes known. You, you would have the crime desk, the political desk, the sports desk, the business desk, and so on. And woe betide any journalist who dared to file a story from the wrong desk, because journalists in those days would very jealously guard their beats. We still have beats and desks to a certain extent, hence the reason for this conference. But journalism these days is more and more becoming an offbeat profession, thanks in no small part to the fact that almost anyone with a smartphone and a blog has a pretty good chance of beating us at our own job, as long as they're in the right place at the right time. That's the New York Times newsroom in 1942. That's a bunch of journalists doing what journalists do best, which is wait for things to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Contrasted with the typical American newsroom of today, there's still a lot of kind of waiting for things to happen in a typical newsroom. And if you've never worked in a real old New York Times style newsroom, I always think that you kind of are missing out on, on quite a lot because the adrenaline and just the noise of typewriters banging away furiously can't be kind of compared to the silent newsrooms of today where people sit in their own kind of spaces and, and look at things happening on computer screens. So journalism has changed in physical ways as well as, as virtual ways. Anyway, just let's, look at, 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 let's just have a look at the a way that the winds of journalism are, are changing. This is a, a local television item from a tornado that hit Missouri, May 23rd this year. It's basically uh, amateur footage and it's an example of how easy it is to get in the news these days if you just have a camcorder, a cell phone, a smartphone in your pocket. Get to your safe room, storm cellar, basement, interior closet, closet or bathroom may not do it. Get out of the way. Get out of the way or get below ground. Piedmont. And then also, you're talking about Deer Creek Edmond, not too far northwest of Mercy and Quail Springs Mall. Okay, so this is how we tend to consume news these days. News kind of happens and it's not necessarily captured and reported by actual professional journalists. Very often, as I was saying earlier, because people have access to 
uh, technologies that allow them to capture news as it happens. Very often it's complete amateurs. Uh, we talk about citizen reporters. I think ours is the only profession where we have to distinguish between citizens and professionals. You, you very rarely hear people talking about citizen plumbers or citizen cardiologists. <laughs> But we, but we have citizen reporters, citizen journalists who, by virtue of the fact that they've captured a news event, are journalists. And it's a, it's a big argument these days about whether or not we can legitimately call them journalists because they've captured some, some, some news happening or whether they are simply eyewitnesses equipped with a, a smartphone. Anyway, this is typically the way news is, is kind of presented to us these days. A little item, if someone's lucky enough to, catch it, to, to capture it on the news, followed by a tweet. Twitter has become the default source for breaking news in just about every single sphere of news. It's, I struggle to recall a single uh, news, breaking news item since I've been using Twitter, which is for about two years now. Twitter is pretty much where I get my news. So the news breaks um, on, a, on, a, on an actual site called Breaking News. It just tells us that a, that a tornado has hit. Then the uh, mainstream newspapers carry the story in traditional mainstream newspaper form with big banner headlines. Uh, this is a good example of a, of a newspaper front page in the age of Twitter and the internet. There's not much point in saying big tornado hits anymore because everyone knows that. And if you use Twitter, if you use social media, you'll probably have this odd feeling that you get when you, when you drive down the road and you see a, a poster telling you the day's news and you think to yourself, that post has been there for a week because you've seen the news half an hour ago or a day ago or two days ago. Seeing it in a poster makes it seem old, not new anymore. So newspapers now have to kind of look for other angles, they have to ask these questions and then they have to answer them in ways that, uh, that Twitter and social media can't. Okay, there's the New York Times which is still very much the global paper of record, reporting on the news in kind of classical behind the scenes ways. Great uh, news photographs shot by professional photographers on the scene. And yeah, we have a guy who works for the New York Times and he has a beat, he's a young guy. His beat is TV and digital media. So he's pretty much the office nerd. And his, <laughs> and his job is to report on stories on and around TV and on digital media. So he's never reported from the field before. He has absolutely no experience as an actual reporter. Um, and this is his beat, which he probably jealously guards. And at the time of the tornado, he, he, he happened to be uh, in Kansas, only a short hop away from Missouri where the tornado broke out. And he suddenly got that nose for news, that instinct that drives journalists to kind of do crazy things. So he called his editor back at the New York Times and said, I'm only half an hour away from Joplin. Should I go out and report? And after an immense outburst of laughter, uh, <laughs> his editor said, OK, cool, go to the scene and see what you can find for us. <laughs> and he was such a novice at his job that he didn't even have the most basic journalistic tool with him, which is a pen. Uh, and although I describe him as a novice, I hardly ever have a pen with me. So <laughs> it's, not something, it's not something uncommon in our profession. But that's how unprepared he was to actually go into the, literally, the eye of the storm and report. All he had with him um, was an iPhone. And the iPhone has become an amazing reporting tool in the 21st century. If you have an iPhone, you can kind of pretty much be a journalist anyway. So this was his tool and his, and, and his power. And he took it and he went out into the field. This is his Twitter bio. I report on TV and digital media for the New York Times. Um, young guy who'd never reported before. Suddenly reporting via Twitter on the scene of this um, literally breaking story. He was the only actual New York Times reporter on the scene. And what he was doing, he was sending, uh, you know, compare these photographs with the actual professional New York Times photographs. You can actually shoot good publishable pictures on an iPhone, but this guy is kind of you know, in terrible weather conditions, doing the best he can. But the point is, he's the guy on the scene. He's the New York Times guy on the scene, and he's sending these, these uh, Instagram pictures and these tweets back to the office. And it's quite amazing that he kind, of, he kind of was doing what, in essence, is a classical kind of form of journalism. The reporter in the field sending telegraphic style reports back, writers on the desk taking his tweets and turning them into actual flowing stories. This goes all the way back to Hemingway and the Spanish Civil War. It's not kind of new. So in an odd way, journalism, journalism is kind of coming full circle. The technology is what makes it really very different. 
Anyway, he sent 100 tweets in total from Joplin, and they're very short, sharp kind of bullet point tweets, but he kind of suddenly, from his beat of TV and digital media, he had the big story he was working on at the time was the final Oprah show, and suddenly, <laughs> um, suddenly he's reporting on this massive, destructive tornado, and he's actually got a book deal as a result of this, purely of this, his first ever experience in the field. Um, so it's quite revolutionary, and I mention it because it's no longer possible in journalism to jealously guard your beat. You may be the, uh, and in fact, some other, someone's going to come along quite soon and take over his jealously guarded beat. He'll probably go on now to be a, a, a general news reporter and to report about other things in, in the same way. And in fact, it's, a, it's actually just, it's a great form of journalism, sending somebody out into the field armed with nothing more than their gut instincts, uh, an iPhone, and ideally a pen. A pen, I think, is still a, an important tool for, for journalists. But I think um, the, way, the way he did what he did has kind of set the precedent, and of course the New York Times is the paper of record, for a whole new way of, of reporting and approaching journalism. At the same time, it's putting professional journalists right into the heart of competition with citizens and, and amateurs. And there are many, many really good examples of complete amateur journalists breaking stories, um, getting good video footage, getting great images from the scene of a breaking news story. What they don't have, what they lack, is the professional restraints that hold the journalist back. So a journalist might have a story from the scene of, of a bank robbery, or, or they might hear about the death of a, of a famous figure, and your instinct, because of the journalistic kind of saying, first is first, so if you're first, you're first, never mind whether or not you got the story exactly right. Being first is what counts. And um, it's very hard for a journalist to resist that impulse. But journalists have to resist the impulse because, because news kind of evolves. Uh, a citizen journalist has no worry about that. They'll just tweet something happened. Whereas a professional journalist has to verify and make sure that they're actually reporting uh, to, to, to a good degree of accuracy. But it is changing our profession. And uh, I hear um, that Media24, who are very kind of... Uh, uh, into um, digital technology now not just encourage but I think kind of demand that the reporters tweet from the scene of breaking news stories so a guy from Bilt for instance will go out um, on a story involving a murder or a robbery and he'll file his copy for the next day's edition but while he's there he must tweet and other, other paper, newspaper groups are really grappling with this and struggling and they don't see any value in it they see uh, the exact opposite. They worry about journalists uh, scooping themselves by tweeting from the scene of an event. But it is, it is happening, and people are doing it, and it's kind of pretty much changing the way people approach their job. Uh, what, this, what all this <coughs> proves is that journalists these days need to be able to march to multiple beats. And this certainly is happening in many cases. Just look at Rolling Stone magazine, for instance, which carries some of the best rip current reporting on crime, politics, the environment and other areas that are not obviously connected to the magazine's mainstream beat of popular music. In fact, Rolling Stone sets the agenda for big news stories over and over again. Uh, the story they had recently about the American general who gave them a very frank uh, interview that led to his resignation. They, they carry stories um, about the environment. They carry really good in-depth crime reporting. And the reason people buy Rolling Stone is actually because Lady Gaga is on the cover. They don't, they don't buy it because uh, Rolling Stone covers serious issues in great depth. By contrast, look at The Economist, which carries some great and incisive commentary on reporting on cultural and sporting matters, as well as on matters of economics. So magazines are crossing beats, they're crossing boundaries and, and barriers, just as journalists are. And then look at yourselves. I think your greatest advantage as journalists to focus on financial matters is that financial matters cover such a vast multitude of interests. Every big industry, every small industry, medium or micro enterprise, every person who needs or makes or spends money is in some way of interest, is in some way the seed of a story for you. How you go about doing that story is another matter altogether. And for all the tools and technologies and techniques, techniques at your disposal, I think there are four essential qualities you need to really distinguish yourself as a journalist. 
these qualities are curiosity. I think this is absolutely crucial, and you'll hear, you'll hear it time and time again that journalists, well, in more ways than one, we're a curious species. But it comes from the childhood instinct of perpetually asking why, and then asking why in response to the answer, and so on and so forth. Journalists never lose that instinct. Other people kind of grow out of it and accept the answers that they're given at face value. But journalists, as I say, ask questions and they question answers repeatedly. So if you're a journalist and you ever find yourself using the word boring, as in that's boring, it means that you've kind of reached the point where you have to kind of ask yourself if you're in the right profession, I think, because journalists should never find anything to be boring. Any, any subject under the sun has got interest in it when you dig down to its core, which is people, how to fix people and who the people are in, in that arena that will make it interesting. Allied to that is empathy. I think it's hugely important for journalists to be able to have a sense of what it's like to be in someone else's skin. Some of the best reporting comes from literally kind of hanging out with people until you kind of feel that you're part of that person's world. For me, um, one of the privileges of being a journalist, not just one of the joys, but it actually is a privilege, is that you've got a passport into the lives of other people. It's quite difficult for people who work in other professions, such as banking, for instance, to pick up the phone and speak to a figure of public interest and say, I'd like to spend a few days with you and ask you a whole bunch of probing questions. When can I meet with you? It's very hard for people to do that. For a journalist, it's part of your job. And you'll generally get an answer that says, yeah, no, that's great. Uh, you know, do it. Um, sometimes uh, an interview alone is, is not enough to kind of really exercise your sense of, of empathy and uh, you need to spend time with, with people to understand who they are and what makes them tick. So an important quality for a journalist, if you lack empathy, you're not going to be able to get beneath the skin. I think talent is vital. I don't think you need to be the next Hemingway. I don't think you need to be an absolutely fantastic writer to do really well as a journalist. Uh, there certainly are people in journalists of varying degrees of writing ability. You get people who are superb reporters and just who battle to put together compelling sentences. Um, effectively, we don't really have it in this country, but it's a model of, of American journalism. We will have reporters in the field doing the hardcore reporting, sending their, their notes, really, back to the office where writers will take over. And that's why if you read Time, Newsweek, and so on, you'll see joint bylines reported by and written by. So you don't need to be a fantastic writer to be a journalist. I think you need some kind of writing talent. It's an odd profession to enter if you don't enjoy writing, for instance. Um, but you need, you need other kinds of talent, and by talent I would include kind of just, you know, persistence, the ability to kind of uh, uh, not give up easily. That's a kind of talent. Um, the ability to kind of relate to people, which is kind of empathy as well. But you do need to have a degree of some kind of talent to make it as a journalist. If you if you can combine good reporting with uh, a probing interview style and you're a good writer on top of it, you're pretty much going to be in demand, whatever your beat happens to be. And then finally, passion. I think that's hugely important. It's, when you think about the vast majority of people who you encounter as you go about your everyday life who kind of work passionlessly in jobs that don't allow them to exercise their passion, they're kind of forced to exercise their passion outside outside work, you know, hobbies, other interests, and, and so on. Um, it's, it makes you kind of think, and it makes you kind of think about how privileged you are to work in an area where your job actually allows you to exercise your passion. Your passion for finding a story. Your passion for speaking to and getting to know people. Your passion for sitting down at the computer and having written something. And write, writing, I find torture but I enjoy the feeling of having written. Uh, passion comes through in many different ways. It's uh, in, in the emotions you put into your story, but overall, it simply comes in in your approach to your work. And I think the journalists that I know, the good journalists, those who do well in their craft, I think what distinguishes them from those who don't do so well is these four qualities. And passion is the kind of hardest one to define. You either have passion as a journalist or you don't. And you can still do your job without that level of passion, but you won't do it as well as your colleague across from you who has passion. So if you combine these elements, these qualities, with the uh, job that you require to do, 
you're in a good position to find stories and there are stories out there waiting, calling on you to combine these qualities to the best of your abilities. There are stories out there, big stories, small stories that are not being reported, like trees falling unheard in the forest. And I have to say, as much as it pains me to say it, that Jimmy Manye has a point when he says that journalists are not covering all the stories they need to cover in South Africa today. I think if you look at, for instance, the government's famous, and he's made them kind of infamous, delivery reports, you know, you look at these reports and they're reported in very dry kind of academic, government, bureaucratic language, and every line is just crying out for a journalist to go out and kind of explore what lies behind and beyond that line. There's very little, um, there's very little reporting from parts of the country that we don't think about that much because they're outside the urban kind of metropoles. Um, and it's a, it's, it's, it's a pity. So many stories just actually go unheard. And, you know, a good editor, I think, could take a dry government delivery report and assign a journalist or ideally a team of journalists to go out and explore what, what this actually means. Is government or is government not delivering? And these stories, by their nature, are kind of stories that touch on economics and finances and money, which is exactly what your beats are. Um, I don't think we need to cover these stories to the, to the satisfaction of Jimmy Manye at all, but I do think we need to go out and cover them rather than spending yet more of our time writing opinion pieces on the trouble with Jimmy Manye. It's a sign of our times as well, and it's a sign of unheard of, unprecedented access to, to um, publishing channels. Anybody now can be a publisher, a distributor, uh, a writer, a reporter. It's so easy, it's so incredibly easy to have a blog. My 17-year-old daughter has a blog. She has a voice. She's an unpublisher, distributor. Uh, journalists, I personally think every journalist should, if not blog, at least tweet. These channels are, are open to you and, as I say, unheard of opportunity for you outside of the scope of your own publication to make your voice heard, um, to say what's happening in your world. Um, and I find that there's an absolute surplus of opinion writing in South Africa today. Uh, in newspapers, um, online, online in particular, uh, it's very reactive. Every time Julius Malemba says or does something, there's this barrage of opinion, and then there are barrages of other opinions re related to those opinions that have just been aired. And it's just kind of there's this huge big circle of journalists kind of talking to themselves really and not really reporting. I think reporting is the essential pillar of journalism. Journalists also kind of um, uh, have a right to and should actually be opinionated. But I think there's just not enough reporting happening in every field of journalism in this country today and there's just like way too much opinion writing. Um, and so at the risk of negating the very reason for this conference, let me conclude by saying to you, don't worry about being a financial journalist, worry about being a journalist. And whatever you write, make it matter to the people who matter, to you and what you do. Your customer, your reason for being in this business. People like me, the reader. Thank you very much.